This is Innovation and Leadership, where we interview Navy SEALs, venture capitalists, pro athletes, best-selling authors, Hollywood filmmakers, really as many different kinds of high achievers as we can get to come on the show. Today's episode is going to be from our mini-series that we created with Corporate Alliance, asking top CEOs and executives and entrepreneurs who have had very large exits, specifically about their thoughts on leadership and people. So you're co-founder, co-owner, CEO of Spark Innovation. Um, you guys make some pretty cool products and, and you've got a pretty impressive track record, both marketing wise and your ability to, to get distribution. Um, just for people who don't know you guys, can you can you cover Fiberfix and some of your other products? And uh, and then maybe we'll talk a little bit about the stats of how some of that stuff's performed. Yeah, so we manufacture and distribute products that are primarily targeted at the home improvement uh, hardware sectors. So Fiberfix is one of our most mature brands. Fiberfix is a water activated repair tape that, that can fix broken items and make those, it, can, it hardens like steel. So it makes them almost as strong as they were before, if not stronger in some cases. And then we've also branched the Fiberfix brand into other tapes and adhesives and things like that. Uh, we have a couple other brands that have done really well. One is called Screen Mend, which was a product that was on Shark Tank. Uh, it's a little repair kit for screen doors and windows. Uh, we took that over as a licensing deal and have grown that brand substantially. We have another product that was on Shark Tank called Illumable, uh, which grew up from a couple of founders uh, here locally and that we ended up partnering with and then buying. And it's uh, a, a product that sits on the on the, the side of a toilet and it lights up the toilet when you walk in in the middle of the night so that you don't hit your shins on the toilet and you don't also have to turn on the blinding light. It's been a big hit. Uh, and then we have another product called um, uh, Cover Grip, which is a uh, throw, throw cloth, mainly for painters, mainly for professionals. Uh, that allows them to um, have a, a slip, a, a non-slip cover so that if they're painting on stairs or things like that, they can have their ladders right on it and it won't move. So it's um, kind of a safety product as well as a really uh, good product for the professional. Those are sort of the four most mature brands that we have. We have a few others that we're developing, but those are the four that that have uh, had the most success in the marketplace. Well, and a lot of people can invent a product. Um, you, you guys are actually good at getting it sold as well. Um, so let's talk about this. You know, uh, a lot of folks will probably have heard of, of your, uh, your fiber fix viral video. When you think about, um, what has worked for getting the word out, can you tell us some of the numbers for, your viral videos, and then uh, and then talk about um, other ways you've got the word out, and uh, and then we'll talk about the retail, the retail side of it all. Sure, yeah the uh, the marketing side of our business, kind of the publicity side of our business, starts primarily with Fiberfix, um, and it starts with Shark Tank. We you know in the first year of doing business with Fiberfix, we landed uh, a spot on ABC's Shark Tank, and um, you know suddenly, 10 million people knew what our product was and what it did, which went a long way toward getting that product into distribution fast and growing the company rapidly. Um, we have since followed that up with a series of videos that we use to market the product online as kind of our primary marketing method. And to date, I think we have somewhere in the 30 to 40 million views uh, on, on most of those videos. Uh, so we've been able to capture a pretty large uh, viewership. Some of that came through just viral distribution. Some of it has come through you know, paid distribution where we've you know, uh, built paid campaigns to kind of distribute those videos and so forth. And we've used that model with other products as well. The other thing that we've done is we've gotten a lot better at using Kickstarter as a way to not just launch a product, but also to get the word out. And so we've had s several pretty successful Kickstarter campaigns for new products that we've launched. 
And so we're getting better at using the internet as a, a means of, of building brand and, and building awareness. You know, we, we wouldn't consider ourselves, you know, the best in the world at those things, but we're getting better at them. Yeah. And, you know, today on the show, I think we're going to talk about, you know, you know, obviously the theme of the show, leadership and people, we're going to talk about what it's like to be a leader and also, you know, you leading a team and, and how to get your people to uh, want to care about the brands like the way they obviously do and, and how you have developed the system that, that does all this. Um, before we get to that, um, you have a pretty uncommon ability to actually get this, you know, these inventions, these products into major retail brands. Can you can you give just a little bit of an overview of you know where where you guys are at, where you where you're placed, and um, and maybe just some stats about about the products you've sold or anything like that you're comfortable with? Yeah, I think with consumer products, there's a little bit of a misconception in in uh in the market you know i think a lot of people think well you know i'm an inventor i have a good idea and you know it's suddenly gonna like take off and and be this awesome product that everybody's gonna know about and that's really just not how it works you know i i kind of separate um you know the the consumer products world into inventors uh versus you know entrepreneurs and we kind of think of ourselves as entrepreneurs. There's things we've invented along the way, <clears throat> but we're not your typical consumer product inventor. That is typically someone who works in their garage and tinkers with things and comes up with brilliant ideas. Probably not the best people to take a product to market because they don't know anything about how to take their genius idea and distribute it to the masses. And that's actually where we come in because we actually do know a lot about that. And so um, over the years, you know, we've been working in retail for about, I don't know, probably about 15 years. And, you know, at first it was a monumental undertaking for us to get a product into uh, retail distribution because we not, knew nothing about it. And it's a really complex world. But over the years, we've learned how to do it. And, you know, we were able to get FiberFix <clears throat> into about 30,000 retail locations within about a year and a half to two years, which is really unheard of. And yeah, and that, so which in, yeah, which store brands is that? Yeah, that included full national distribution at Home Depot and Lowe's, which are the two most coveted, you know, uh, retailers for that kind of product. It also included a massive distribution at Ace and True Value and a lot of other big brands that people recognize. And so uh, there's a lot that goes into that, but that is something that we're especially good at is working with large retailers and getting new products onto shelves, which is you know very difficult to do. It's not hard. It's not necessarily hard for somebody like Gorilla or 3M to get a new product on shelves because they already have massive distribution in all these retail outlets. But when you're introducing a brand new brand, a brand new product into market, to get that onto retail shelves in national retailers is pretty hard to do. And I think that in some ways we've, we've done that really well. So, so let's talk about that. Um, you know, let's say there's somebody listening today that, that um, they're thinking, you know, are, you know, maybe they're not selling exactly for your market, but they're saying we would like to get in, you know, increased distribution for, for our company. Um, what are some of the things that you feel like maybe you, wouldn't have known had you not done this yourself for all these years. What, what, what's a tip for the rest of us <clears throat> that want to work with those folks who, who control what goes on shelves across 30,000 locations? Well, I think the biggest, I think the biggest learning for us over the years is that retailers are not looking for products. They're looking for programs. And what I mean by that is you can bring in this awesome new product that does something that's incredibly useful and incredibly different than what's out there but just because you have a cool product doesn't mean a retailer is going to take it because if you haven't thought through how that program is going to work in their stores look like and how it's going to be marketed and how it's going to be distributed and in what stores it's going to be distributed and how many units are going to sit on a shelf and how those units are going to be displayed and how a consumer is going to interact with those things and all of the, the, the pricing and all of the things that go into a program, then they're not going to be interested because they don't, you haven't done their job for them. You haven't helped them 
uh, understand how this product is going to work in their stores. And so it could be the greatest product in the world, but if you haven't thought through a program for it, you're, you're going to lose their interest. And that's what I find happens with a lot of these entrepreneurs is they, they go to market with a product and they just can't believe that the retailers won't buy it. And it's not because the retailers don't see the value in the product it's because there's just not a program to support it. That's been thought through and developed. Yeah. You know, it's interesting, this principle you brought up of really thinking it through from their perspective. It sounds so simple, right? But most of us are either we're getting measured by our investors or our boss or whoever um, by, you know, we're getting measured in terms of our perspective, right? It's what, it's what goes on to the reporting. It's what goes on to, you know, whether it's a, it's what gets discussed at a employee <laughs> annual performance review or at, you know, CEO bonus time with the board. That's what gets reviewed. Yeah, it's a great point. And it's a good way to think about it because if you think about, you know, most buyers, even for a huge retailer like Walmart or Target or Costco or Home Depot, they're just middle managers that are trying to, you know, make a good name for themselves in the company, right? And so, again, if you bring them a really cool product, but you haven't really thought through how it's going to make them successful, it doesn't matter, right? It just doesn't matter to them. If The product could be the coolest thing in the world, but they're not going to take a risk on it and put themselves out there and jeopardize their career if they don't think the success of the program has been thought through. You know, um, it's so easy to talk about stuff like this and it, it's so easy for any one of us to, um, you know, it's like marking your own homework, right? Um, to claim, oh yeah, I understand my customer. I know what's going on for them. Um, but it seems like the folks that don't just give themselves a pass of, well, I know this industry, so I know how it works. The folks that are like deeply, you know, those deeply customer obsessed organizations like an Amazon or something, a Zappos, right? Yep. They're the ones that seem to really be getting ahead in life just from my observation here, you know, as far as growing revenue and things like that. Um, yeah, because if you look at Amazon, I mean, it's a great point. Amazon is, you know, the, the kinds of products that are on Amazon are really irrelevant. Now, I mean, at this point, everything's on Amazon, so you can find anything you want. But that wasn't always the case, right? So why did they grow so quickly? Well, it's because they really were thinking about the consumer experience and how to make everything so convenient and so easy to, to do for the customer that anything that they could buy on Amazon, they would. And, and that's why we're seeing such tremendous growth there now. Yeah. Do you know this guy, uh, Derek Sivers? He's got TED Talks with millions of views. He built the first online music store CD, baby. Have you heard of him before? I don't, I don't think I have. Great blogger, other stuff. But he, uh, I love his perspective of like, <clears throat> if we're concerned with service first, money is a natural byproduct of that. Mm -hmm. um, whereas when we come in and say like, I want to make this much money. What do I have to do to get it sold? It's a more of an uphill battle. Right. And for me, I'd love your thoughts on this. It feels like that applies with staff also of like, I need staff to do this. How am I going to get it, get them to do it? Right. Where like, um, I don't know. It'd be interesting to hear if you've ever had a boss like this, somebody who was like thinking about life in terms of your goals and like, Yes, the organization needs things. Yes, the boss gives the assignments. But when they can talk to you about it in terms of what they know you're trying to do with your career or your commission check that time or what your, what your division you're running is trying to get done and you get that assignment, at least in some sort of context for what's going on for you, it seems like so much easier to buy into a request like that. Would, would you say? Yeah, I agree. One of my very first, probably my very first manager in a real professional setting when I started my career, I started with uh, Anderson Consulting, which is now Accenture um, down in the Bay Area. And, you know, my first manager was that kind of guy. Like he really was interested in my success, interested in, in, develop, in my development as a professional. Um, and I felt that, you know, it wasn't for him. It wasn't about just making himself look good or the project being completed. It was really about, hey, what does Eric Child need to become successful? And what does he need to become a manager and grow and, and, and be successful and get promoted and all those kinds of things? 
And um, it had a big impact on me. And, and, and when we look for employees now, uh, naturally we, we hire people to do specific things and because we have specific needs. But you know, we tell them right up front that one of our goals in this organization is to help build professionals that can do the same things we do. We, t we tend to look for entrepreneurial type um, uh, people who want to start their own businesses at some point. And our stated goal with them right from the start is, look, we know you want to do this at some point in your career, so we want to help you get there. Because if you come and work with us for a few years, you're going to have a big leg up on the competition. You're really going to understand how to do this the right way. And we've had, we've had several of them leave us and go do really cool things. And we're excited for them, you know, when that happens, because that's really one of our goals is to, to, to build, you know, our, 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 one of our goals is not just to build a successful company, but to also build the ecosystem of consumer products in Utah. And, you know, we look to do that in a couple of different ways. We look to do that through our company, through the products that we launched into market, but also through the professionals that we hope we're, we're training along the way. And so, you know, I don't know that we're always uh, super good at it, but that's definitely one of our goals. Um, and just f to give some people a little context, like um, <clears throat> for, for the success you guys have had, you know, you've got you've got these YouTube videos with, I think, 30 million plus views altogether. Correct me if I got that wrong. And are there other stats about, you know, sales or units or anything that you can share? Well, it depends on the product we have. Um, we have, so let me give you a good example. So um, one of the products I told you about was called Screen Mend. Screen Mend was started by uh, an airline pilot and his two daughters. And it was a, an idea they had for patching holes in screen doors and windows. And, you know, they were taking this mesh and they were dipping it in wax and they were creating this, this little product. And they got a gig on Shark Tank and it kind of exploded their business and they weren't really ready for it. They were still manufacturing out of their garage. Uh, they got some big orders right off the bat and couldn't fulfill those because they didn't have the manufacturing capacity. When they did finally um, fulfill some of those orders, the product was stuck together and it was poorly manufactured and, <clears throat> and poor quality. And we got in touch with them. They, we sort of randomly got in touch with, they, well, I should say they got in touch with us <clears throat> as kind of helping them manufacture. And they realized pretty quickly that, you know, not only could we, man could we manufacture it, but we would be much better than them at distributing it and, and growing the business. And so we took their very small business uh, that was run out of their garage and, and took it over in a licensing deal. And within a year, we were doing two and a half million dollars in sales. And that included full distribution at Home Depot uh, and several other big retailers. And within two years, we had it within all of the major retailers that would have mattered for that product. And so um, they are now getting a royalty check that's in the hundreds of thousands for doing nothing but showing up once a year at our retreat and kind of shaking hands and saying hello. And so it's, a, it's been a really good partnership and worked out really well. And those are the kinds of success stories that we're we're pretty excited about. We've done that three or four times in different different types of products, and it's been a it's been fun to watch. Yeah. By the way, if anybody listening does <clears throat> has some invention they want to talk to you guys about, is the best thing for them to just go to sparkinnovation.net, or what's the best way? Yeah, sparkinnovation.net is a good, great way to find out about us. Um, and then we also are founders of Product Power Up, which is going to be an annual event. We had our first event in October uh, as really a way to bring the consumer product community together, uh, both in networking and education and, and all those kinds of things, deal making and, and so forth. Um, and, you know, we've actually met uh, entrepreneurs at that event that uh, has translated into deals as well. So, um, you know, so that's another thing that we uh, would hope is that we can get anyone who's really interested in the, in the consumer product world to start attending those events with Product Power Up. And then, like you, like you said, they can reach us through sparkinnovation.net as well. That's great. Well, I think this is a big, great place to end for part one of the episode. Uh, please tune in next time. We're going to be asking uh, Eric more about 
product power up and and uh get more tips on how the rest of us can learn from eric's success thanks uh, for making time here eric yeah no problem